Um, I've got some organized remarks uh, backed up by some slides, but that doesn't mean this should be a formal session. It's small enough that uh, please interrupt, ask questions, and then there'll be some time for discussion and questions and comments afterwards, and I'll stay for as long as there's a, a desire to talk about something. Um, the, my orientation in doing this practicum is, first of all, to make it very specific how to uh, nitty-gritty type of things. Uh, this is not a, uh, a series of sessions that's uh, um, talking about broad concepts particularly. It also is not talking about the development of a business plan. Uh, this kind of assumes that you've already got an idea or that you're going to be a de developing an idea of some kind offline. This is literally when you have a, an idea or if you've already started, what are some of the things to think about in terms of starting the enterprise, uh, developing the enterprise, and it's very specific in how to. Having said that, there's many, many ways to do things, and this is just kind of one navigation through many, many options. So this is not intended to be the way to do it, it's just a way to do it. And think of it as sort of a checklist of things you might want to be thinking about. Uh, as you go forward. Some of you, if you if you've already are currently engaged in business, some of these things may not apply. Um, and as we go through, uh, you know, I'd ask you to kind of take what is relevant to your situation and then just uh, yeah, bear with us as we go through things that may not be as relevant. So this is the very, very beginning, you know, creating your identity. This presumes, as I just said, that you have a business concept in mind or perhaps you've even started it. Um, and it doesn't have to do with, you know, what are you going to do, but once you have some direction in terms of the, uh, the business concept or idea, creating the identity is one of the very first things you would do um, uh, to, to get started. Um, no, I've had this issue before. Should just be able to click the arrow. Yeah, I know. There we go. Okay. Okay, the first thing is coming up with a name. And as that uh, quote from Shakespeare indicated, um, you know, a name is, uh, uh, can be very important, uh, although you can have a pretty lousy name and uh, still do quite well. But if you think about some of the brands that we uh, hold dear, uh, many of them are clever. And they had a lot of thought that went into um, uh, some kind of correspondence between the name and what it was that the uh, company was actually doing. So here's some, some things to think about. Um, first of all, the name is going to be at some point, or a name is, has to be at some point, the legal foundation. So if you, whether you're a partnership or incorporated or whatever, uh, that's going to be sticking with you in a formal way. So uh, you need to keep, be mindful of that and then make sure that that somehow corresponds to the use of the name, which may or may not be identical to the actual legal name. You also obviously want to do things like have positive word associations. Uh, so you don't want any, and if you're going to be international, you need to be thoughtful about what these words mean in some foreign languages. And there's been some ex uh, humorous examples of when people didn't think that through. So you don't want to come up with a, with a cool looking English word and find out it's a, it's an obscenity in, in uh, uh, French or, or something like that, or you know, that somehow it's going to have a, a weird connotation. Uh, it's helpful to have it be pronounceable and relatively easy to spell. And if, if there's a misspelling, you don't want to make that particularly easy to do, and I'll come up, I'll have a few examples. It needs to be unique enough, but not so unique that nobody knows what, what it is and it's uh, you know, difficult to, to understand. And a really great way to, to go through a name is to come up with lots of examples and brainstorm and ask people, what do you think? Uh, and coming up with a name can, can take a while. Coming up, with a, well, coming up with a lousy name can be pretty quick, but coming up with a really good name is, uh, is sometimes, uh, uh, takes a lot longer than you might think. Um, now, for those of you who are in business already, I presume you have names. So how many of you have, have names? And of those of you who have names, are you incredibly happy with your names? Okay, so there's no need to change a name. So hopefully, when you've got a good name, as I go through this list, you might just say, well, okay, my name is, you know, that, that's true for my name, that's true for my name, and so forth, so as we go through. Um, 
So what are some parameters you might think about in dreaming up and brainstorming a name? Uh, first of all, think about it as being segment appropriate. So some names are great for certain kinds of activities and not good for other kinds of activities. Um, for example, if you're going to come up with a, with a new bank, you might not want to call it Zen Bucks uh, for a couple of reasons. It's, uh, it might be confused with a coffee drink, but it also doesn't seem uh, uh, serious enough to maybe be a bank. It sounds you know, on, the, on the kind of uh, you know, too trendy side. Um, if you're thinking about a new social network concept and, and, find, and call it find a pal, maybe it's, it's too unsophisticated. It's not really great for that segment. So you want to make sure that the cultural attributes of whatever that name is correspond to the segment that you're thinking about. Um, it's also great, if possible, to come up with the embedded business concept in the name itself. So that if somebody hears the name, the, one of the, the first or second associations they might have are pretty close to what this business is. And a, and a good example is, is a company called Deep Water Wind. Now, if that's all you knew about this company, Deep Water Wind, you had no idea, you just saw that name, you saw the URL, what do you think it might be? Well, it happens to be offshore wind turbines, which is pretty close. But, I, mean, I, mean, I, I mean, I don't know what else deep water wind might be, but, but that's an example of the concept being embedded in the name. Um, and as I said before, you want it to be culturally sensitive, and you want it to be URL friendly. And a URL, of course, is the web address that, uh, that we all have that corresponds to the, your IP address of the web server. So some general pitfalls. Um, well, I guess the worst pitfall would be you're, you're in, infringing a trademark because you didn't go through uh, the research necessary to make sure you weren't infringing on a trademark, and I'll talk about that a, in a little more detail in a minute. Um, you don't want to do something that confuses and, A-N-D, with and percent. Um, you know, in the old days, it used to be, you know, uh, Smith and Sons, in the, in, you know, going back 100 years ago. And that's because we didn't have URLs and we didn't have uh, you know, a lot of complex things. It was just a sign on the store, and that would be appropriate for that. But in today's world, you want to avoid confusing symbols with words and so forth because it's going to be complicated when it gets to things like being web friendly. Um, you, you need to make it uh, or avoid character complexity. Uh, a, a minimum of spaces, dots, commas, dashes, numbers, because you're going to have to deal with that as you go forward. Avoid something that's trite and overused, toys for you, something like that, that, that tends to be you know, a little, little uh, overdone at this point. And the overuse of I or E, I think Apple can get away with this, but uh, you've got to be careful with that as well these days. And again, some of these are trends and fads. And you don't want to be caught up in having a you know, 1996 name when you're launching something in 2010. Now, talking about the URL, because more and more the correspondence between the legal name and the identity and the URL is, is really kind of coming together. And you want to have this be unified, or at least th think through what the attributes are that, to make it unified. So adjoining words that repeat letters is, is, is difficult, like legal limit. doesn't look good. It might be an okay name, but it looks funny as a URL. Confusing phonetic spelling. So let's say you called something bricks. You know, let's say you're in a construction th company or something, and you spell it with an X. You know, you can pretty much be sure that most people are going to forget that or they'll misplace it. So you have to be very careful if you're going to come up with an alternative spelling. Hyphens and underscores, very difficult for people to understand and remember. Where do they go? A hyphen looks like an underscore. Um, and sometimes people are going to mistype that and misunderstand it. And then there's a whole lot of things that have to do with poor readability. Um, this was a real company. It was um, uh, uh, Experts Exchange. But every time I look at it, it looks like Experts Sex Change to me. So you, you really don't want to uh, have something that doesn't look right as you string words together without spaces. Non-human language is a problem. This is actually truly the website for the flu, uh, H1N1. I don't know what the people at the CDC were thinking. It's almost, you know, how many people, if I said, okay, close your eyes and now on a piece of paper, write down what the URL 
is could do it. You know, half of you are going to make mistakes. You know, and forget is it a capital N, small N? It's very difficult. Awkward lowercase. Let's say your existing company is called ABC Consulting. It's you know the problem is replicated up here with that double letter thing, but it just looks funny. And uh, again, sometimes you're an existing business, and it doesn't translate well into a URL. So you want to think through well. Can you modify your name a little bit? Can you shorten it? Can you come up with uh, some kind of resolution of that problem? Confusing composites. Uh, uh, this is another real URL. Is it go to Tahoe, go Tahoe, or get a hoe? Is it, is it, a, you know, is it a gardening store, or is this something to do with uh, you know, travel, going to uh, Tahoe, California? It's actually Go Tahoe. This was, a, this was I, th I think, a, a promotional thing for the state of California. They didn't quite think it through. Um, you can invent spelling, and there's a lot of great examples of uh, either very obscure words like Google, which is a real word but was pretty obscure, uh, or invented words. They, those can work really well. eBay is obviously an invented word. Um, but if you do it, make sure that the spelling kind of conforms to normal spelling rules. Uh, so if you had something called hookah and you had three O's instead of two, uh, you're going to find a lot of people forgetting that it's three. And it's even hard to, when you look at it and then look away, it's hard to remember that. So these are just simple rules to make it URL readable and understandable. So the name really is the URL. Increasingly, uh, we have examples of uh, major corporations that exist almost entirely on the web, and if they're not entirely on the web, so much of, his, of it is related to the website that these things kind of merge together. So if, if the name is the URL, 5 to 12 characters is probably optimal. Could it be 14? Sure, it can be 14. Could it be 2 or 3? It could be. But, you know, this is kind of the general, they're on a bell curve. I would say most of the good names out there are 5 to 12 characters. In an existing business, uh, or uh, if you're going to start one, uh, it, you, you need to think through the full name you might have versus an abbreviation. So the University of Miami, I believe, was founded in 1926. Somebody can correct me, 25, whatever. So they weren't thinking about a URL back then. It was the University of Miami. But that has to get translated to the web. So it's UMiami, is that what I think that's what it is, UMiami.edu. The EDU, by the way, is the um, convention for reserving domains for educational uh, institutions. Um, and that's why it's not UMiami.com or .org. Org is the uh, reservation, the, the convention for generally not-for-profit activities non-commercial. Non com is short for commercial, so that's the domain uh, reservation for commercial activities. And then there are many, many others that have to do with countries, um, and, um, and there's a lot of other stuff that's, uh, uh, that's bandied about. Um, but the University of Miami made that translation to umiami.edu, uh, uh, which is not too bad. It's pretty clear you know, that somebody could think through that was. America Online uh, you know, started out when the internet was, uh, was pretty new and everybody called it America Online because at that time if you said AOL.com nobody knew what that meant. But over time they had to migrate so they used their you know, first initials America Online to come up with, with AOL. I would say that's kind of a, you know, they did the best they could but this was an early day as they were evolving uh, through this. Facebook is Facebook.com. You know, it's, it's not American Facebook Inc. or something, it's just Facebook.com. So increasingly, as we go through this kind of evolution, the name is the URL. It might have an LLC or an Inc. or something because you need that for legal purposes, but the bulk of that name uh, really more or less has got to be what the URL is. Okay. Again, if it can be self-descriptive, I had the other example before, but Rain Bank, this is a real company. What, what, what would, if you just saw the name Rain Bank, uh, what would it be? Well, it happens to be a passive water collection. Or, you know, it rains on a roof, goes into a gutter, and they collect the water. Uh, so it's kind of cute. Uh, it's, an, it's the notion of conserving, saving as a bank. Obviously, it's rain. 
so you can kind of make that correspondence. It's a great URL. It's easy to see. The two words in English you know, are, are clearly uh, easily distinguishable. Um, and it, it's between five and 12 letters. Uh, it works pretty well. That's an example. In a, in a high-tech example, nano solar. Uh, this happens to be a, a nanoparticle printing for thin film solar panels. It's a real company. Uh, and another example of kind of putting that together. So the domain uh, extensions I already talked about, com is commercial, org is for not-for-profit. Net was very popular in the early days because it had to do with companies that were involved with the internet itself uh, and with uh, um, uh, you know, the kind of configurations and, and laying of the cable and having to do with uh, connectivity and so forth. There's a number of companies that are still called that, uh, including some of the companies that are involved with registering domain names. But generally speaking for you, unless you're going to be actually in that business, that's probably not going to be an option for you. So probably 99% um, of you are going to try or should be trying to get a .com name uh, because that's going to be uh, the, the overwhelming uh, direction of, of where this activity is. Um, now, for those of you who already have existing businesses and have a URL, how many of you have .coms? And how many are not a .com? Anybody not a what, what are you, a dot what? Dot info. Dot info. Now, why did you do that? That's, that's a, because that's another one of these alternative domains. Because the dot com was taken. The dot com was taken. <laughs> so, yeah, the dot com was taken, and you had already uh, started the business, and you, couldn't, you didn't have a choice? Um, it, it got taken after I did a search for it, like about three months after I did a search for okay, it. Okay, so you hadn't reserved it yet. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that. And you still... It was too late to go back? And do you regret it, or is it pretty easy to tell people it's dot .info? Um, it's, it's pretty early on, so, so I don't know yet. Okay, you might rethink it and think about a dot .com, because you know, if, you think in, if you're going to people say, well, there's blah, 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 dot .info, how many of you knew what dot .info was? Okay, one, one, so, you're, you're, you're going against 90% of the people, and this is a, a relatively uh, aware audience. 90% of the people have no idea what dot .info is and, and what that's really going to mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I see you put a lot of importance in dot .com. I mean, what if you think your name is really what's important? I mean, it seems like there's almost a distrust in dot .net and, I mean, besides being a nonprofit, that can dot .org. I mean, what if you really think your name is that important? Well, if it's so important and somebody already has the dot com, you might ask yourself, well, what are they doing? I mean, I mean after all, if you, let's say you have, you know, your, your great company name is XYZ, and you want to be XYZ.com, there's already an XYZ.com, and you're going to be XYZ.cc or .us, you know, which are, which are actually, uh, you know, domain names, but are, are company, uh, are country specific. But let's say you're going to do that. How many people are going to confuse XYZ.com with you? If, if the name is so powerful, you're going to be, there's a lot of people that have heard your name XYZ, say, oh, well, it's XYZ.com, so I'll go there. Um, you have to be very careful about that. In the early days of the internet, when these domain names were floating out there and smart you know, uh, high school seniors who were kind of techies could go out and reserve DeltaAirlines.com, before the guys at Delta knew what was going on. There were a whole lot of names that were taken up by these uh, smart little kids. And, uh, and the big company said, that doesn't matter. We're just going to use alternative names and forget about the obvious name that has a .com. And it was a disaster, and they ended up buying all the names back. You know, so, so um, you know, I think you have to be very careful about us presuming that the dot com uh, is something you can work around. Now, some, uh, there's some examples like Delicious, where it's embedded in the name. Everybody know what that site is? You know, and, it's, and, it's, and because of the way they've done the name, it's so clever that the dot com extension is part of the name. And that's an example of working around it. Yeah? I was going to say one of the best examples of that is like Nissan.com. It's owned by some computer company. Mm -hmm. And they refuse to give it up to Nissan. And every time I try to go to the Nissan yeah. website, right. I always Right. And there's, a, there's a number of examples that, that people just uh, actually had started competing businesses. Um, you know, there's, there's a Delta faucets and Delta Airlines. And if you go to Delta.com, I think you get the faucets. I'm, I'm not even sure. But, I mean, that's an example of these are legitimate conflicts 
and whoever got there first. So thinking about this is important. Yeah. You say you have a choice between like keeping your full name of your business or shortening it. Would it be better to shorten it for like the dot com purposes, or should you keep the whole name so people remember? Well, okay. Is, if the, is the whole name more than twelve letters? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you shorten it like from four words to two words. Would it be like would people remember it? Well, you know, it, I would check it out with doing some brainstorming and asking friends and, you know, asking people because the URL more and more is just so critical and you don't want to be, have people fumbling around with, you know, you know what is this thing, you know. Um, and if you have a, uh, a very long name with four words, then they're all run together, um, it may be difficult. And the longer it is, the more mistakes there can be and the, the more people can forget about it. So yeah, I mean, the shorter, the, the, the more discreet, the more unique, uh, avoiding some of the things I've talked about, I think the better. Eric, before we get off of the name thing, I, I have sort of a fundamental question that I always sort of wrestle with. Uh, I'd be curious of your take up on it. Obviously, the, the trend in names now is to go with these clever uh, ones that you remember, like Google or Zappos or whatever, uh, whereas the older tre trend would have been, you know, these more descriptive names. Um, you know, and you're talking a lot about being self-descriptive. On the other hand, you're saying Google's a great name, which of course it is. I mean, wh what do you think if you're starting a company from scratch and you're picking a name? I mean, wh which trend do you tend toward? Well, well, actually, Google is descriptive. Uh, Google is is the is the name, as you know, for a for a very large number, large number and yeah. so they, they were going to, you know, their concept was to have very large numbers of stuff on the web. And I guess you could say that, you know, it was clever and cute. And uh, if you're not a PhD yeah. student in physics. Yeah, you're right. Not necessarily right. Be aware of that. You know, you can have a. I think you can have a cute name that works. That's kind of a nonsense word. Um, and, and I mean Yahoo. Uh, which is actually a city in, uh, in Mississippi, I believe. I've actually been there, Yahoo City. And, uh, and Yahoo used to be a blues record label uh, of some prominence in the 1920s and 30s. But Yahoo, as a search engine, you know, when people, uh, when they came up with it, uh, I, what was it? Well, I guess it was, kind of a, it was kind of a cry, you know, like, yay, Yahoo. I mean, I don't know what Yahoo meant. And it was nonsense. I mean, it was, it, was, it was something different. And they made a go of it. And they did very, very well from a marketing point of view. So I guess it could go either way. I think the point is you want to make it um, memorable, uh, easy to remember, looks good as a URL, um, something that, if possible, describes what it is you're doing. Um, and if you follow as many of those rules as you can, you'll probably have a, a good name. Uh, there are examples. Uh, if you're if you're in some kind of professional business service, and let's say you're doing um, mine testing for uh, you know coal mines or something like that, and the name of the company is Technical Mine, you know Testing Inc., and your URL is Testing Mine Inc. or something like that, is that going to ruin your business? Well, probably not, because this is so B to B, business to business, that the whole URL attributes are going to be secondary. Most of your business may not be conducted in anything remotely having to do with an internet capability. And so it may not apply. Um, so, um, you know, that's, it's possible that the URL is not very compelling in what you're doing. But if you have the choice, you might as well try to get it right the first time. And if, if you can't, then you just go forward. Let me just talk a little bit about the, the legal name versus the brand name. And, um, and it's something for you to think through just so you know where you are with this. Um, you can have a business concept where it's completely unified. The legal name is the brand name. And there's really no distinction of, of, any, of, uh, of any magnitude. For example, PayPal, it's PayPal. PayPal has lots of different kinds of services. They're always PayPal something. But it's, but it's PayPal. Federal Express, they have different package sizes. They have different delivery periods, you know, two day, overnight. It's all Federal Express. They don't, don't bother to brand these things individually. Google is another example. Google's doing all kinds of stuff um, and all kinds of products, and it's always Google. With the possible exception of Gmail, that they kind of got out there as maybe a, a sub-brand. But, uh, you know, pretty much this is all under, uh, you know, that name. Then there are umbrella companies 
Microsoft is a good example because Microsoft has put a lot of energy behind brands for individual products. So we have Microsoft Office. In the old, old days, before that, it was Excel. And that was, they put a lot of energy behind Excel. They had databases. They have, obviously, Windows. Um, in the new environment, um, Microsoft is having some problems because this is becoming less and less a software product business for them. And they're struggling because they're kind of, you know, their heritage is these strong software brand names. But uh, that's where the business has migrated, where the branding and the name uh, was something that, that's maybe 15 years old, and they're trying to you know, figure out what to do in the new environment. So uh, uh, that's a little bit of a challenge for them. Ford and the car companies, I'll just put Ford as an example. For many, many, many decades, uh, there have been the main automobile name, and then, of course, the models have their own brands. So, you know, there's Mustang or Chevy or, you know, or, or, or whatever. And, um, and that's an umbrella concept with very strong, specific uh, individual brand names. Then, of course, there's the unrelated, uh, you know, Geico is the, uh, all those great ads you see on TV. And probably most of you, unless you were following this as an investment, would not know that Berkshire Hathaway owned Geico. Berkshire Hathaway is a, uh, basically a holding company. Uh, they don't do any advertising. You know, you've never heard of them. Uh, so that's a completely unrelated and detached corporate name from the brand. So why do I mention this? Because you may have started a company already with a name that is not exactly great. So you could step back and say, OK, that's going to be your legal name. And you're going to disassociate the legal name from actually your business activity name and your URL. So one way of stepping around the naming problem uh, if you have something that's really not going to be workable or is too common and too easily confused with something else is to just put that over as the legal name, put it in the closet, and start all over again with a name that's going to represent your business. And there's no problem with that. You know, you can come up with as many names as you want. There's absolutely no issue with doing that. So there's many ways of handling this. And it's appropriate to what kind of business you have. You may have sub-brands or sub-activities, sub-services that you want to brand and want to identify, or you might want to have it all completely together, or you may want to have it disassociated. OK, so once you've done this great brainstorming and you come up with this fabulous URL, you say, oh, God, I, I want to, you know. Uh, so you say, the first thing you do is check, and it's taken. So how do you check? And, how do it, and if, and if uh, you go to uh, something, and I hope this is going to work here. There we go. You go to who's this? Who's this? <laughs> this is basically a, a, a big database uh, which has uh, all the names, and it tells you um, who's got it. It doesn't necessarily tell you exactly who has it because there's ways to mask that, as I will tell you in a minute. But this tells you whether the name is available or not available. It will also tell you which extensions of that name are available. So a lot of names may be already taken with a .com, but not with some of these other names. Now, that may be good news or bad news because, again, we just talked about the confusions with the different extensions. So the first thing you want to do is go to who's this, okay, um, and, uh, uh, and, and look this up. Now, this is a common utility, who's this, and it's hosted by many different companies. I just happen to go to the networksolutions.com site. But you can, if you just do a who's this search on Google, uh, you know, you'll come up with lots of places to access this. So number one thing to do is check out your name. And by the way, this is a great way to put in your, your brainstorming ideas because you want to just keep on checking, checking, checking until you say, aha, the .com extension, because that's really what you ought to be grabbing for, is available. And sometimes you're going to have to be creative to come up with something. Your first choice, unfortunately, may not be uh, available. Okay, it's available. So uh, what do you do? Well, I would, uh, if it's the name you really want and it's available, I would get it the next 10 minutes. Because you come back to check in three days, it may not be available. You came back, what, three months later? Uh, the, the info, dot info guy back there? You came back three months later and it was gone? Yeah. See, for, for $10, you could have saved yourself that problem. But because you could have, even though you weren't even sure you were going to go forward, for about the, the cost of going to McDonald's, you can reserve the name. 
Uh, so it's not that expensive to go out there. And if you end up not using it, well, that's the way it goes. You just uh, you don't renew it. Okay, so, so you do your search, and um, uh, there's a difference between registrars and hosting companies. A registrar has been uh, anointed by the great internet god to be able to handle the registration of URLs. And remember, a URL is a character name that points to an IP address. Does everybody know what an IP address is? Internet protocol address. Internet pro Computers don't speak English or any other language. They just speak numbers. So a computer server needs to have a specific number that's assigned. And it's very hard for human beings to remember numbers. So there's this translating element behind the number that goes to a name. Okay, so this is just one big, you know, lexicon translator. And because you can't have everybody uh, sorting out, you know, registering names, or, you know, unless it's all coordinated, this is coordinated by a governance body, and those people are called registrars. So you have to register a name through a registrar. <coughs> Some of the registrars, uh, well, in the old days, the registrars were literally independent, and they, all, all they did was they were in the registrar business. Increasingly, though, they're combined with hosting. And there are some companies that only do hosting, some people that only, very few now that just do registrars, but more and more they registrar, they, that is, they, they register the name for you, and they give you the option to have a hosting package. What's hosting? Hosting is having some space on a web server uh, connected to the internet so that you could put up a, a website. Okay? Now, so when you go to get your registration, um, there's a couple of things you could do. You could only register the name, that's possible, or you could register the name and get some web space at the same time. You can park it uh, before, it's like what, what it sounds like, before you do any web development, which is really basically saying, I, I want to reserve a name. You have a, maybe a single page that you have. You don't really have web, a website, you don't have web capabilities, you don't have storage, but you have a way of holding that name until you're ready to use it. Um, you can also get a name and forward it to some other address. So let's say you'd already built a website under abc.com and you decided that now your new name is xyz.com and you can reserve xyz.com and point it so that every time you, put, you type that in, it goes to abc.com. So there, and, and by the way, that, that's a good way to reserve alternate names for your company that you think either may be confusing or maybe you're using alternate names and you want all the traffic flow to come to one place. So you can forward. And then there's the question of how long do you reserve uh, the name for when you register it and also, by the way, when you sign up for hosting uh, and renewing it. And, and yeah. Yeah, I, I don't really understand the distinction between um, registering the concept or the, the name and then parking. Well, many times the company that registers the name will offer a parking service for you. Uh, I mean, in the old days when this was very disaggregated and much less consumer friendly than it is now, you would have to go to a registrar, register the name, and that's all they did. I mean, then it was up to you to point the servers and do all the MX files and all the other kinds of things you'd have to do to, to make sure that that address was pointing to a name server and that was doing all the technical things you need. Increasingly, this has come down to being very co consumer friendly. And there's often these things that are kind of in a package. You just kind of point and click uh, when you sign up for the name. And parking is one of those things that's kind of given to you so that the name points through the, through the name registrar and the DNS server, which is the domain name, to a particular page. But it does so in a way that it's holding it for you. So it's a convenient way to, to just have a place you can point to. Uh, you don't have to do that. But sometimes when you're not ready to pay money to build the website, let's say you're going to build the website in three months, and you don't want to pay the fees to hold on to that chunk of space, just park it, which is usually you know, five bucks or something. It's pretty cheap. Um, length and renewals, I mean, generally speaking, when you start out, you want to have the shortest possible time because that gives you the greatest flexibility. Prices tend to come down in this market, so uh, there's no need to sign up for your lifetime. You know, in the, in the early days of the internet, they would have this reserve a name for $10,000 for your life. 
well, you know, it was like, because the next year it was like $400, and the next year after that it was $20. So you really don't necessarily want to do that. So short time frames and be prepared to renew. You may have a name or something you discard, so you don't want to renew it, and that's a good way to manage it. Um, we talked about related extensions. Uh, if you got the .com name, you may also want to get some other related extensions around your name to protect it. So that if you have abc.com, you may want to get abc.org and abc.info and abc.something uh, because you may be concerned about confusion or somebody else impinging on your territory. In most cases, that's really probably not going to be an issue, and I've personally never gone ahead and bothered to do that. But it's something you could do with a little extra money. Um, there may be name variants. Uh, you, there may be an alternative spelling. There may be something that uh, may be in a foreign language. You just want to make sure you lock it all up, so you may want to go ahead and do that. Um, there's something called public versus non-public registration. Sometimes you have to pay extra to be non-public. What that means is that when you first register a name and it's public, it's actually you are identified as the site owner. So it would be like Eric Chris, blah, 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 and I'd have to have a business address and phone number and so forth. There's lots of reasons to mask that because you may not want to make it particularly clear who owns the website for a lot of different reasons. And as a matter of course, I always make it non-public. So if you go into and try to look at all the websites I'm, I'm associated with, it'll just it'll have the name of the hosting company. It won't have me. Um, and uh, it's something you may or may not want to do, but it's relatively inexpensive to do that. And finally, there's the option of hosting versus non-hosting. You could get the name and point it to some other company that's doing the hosting. Or you might want to uh, blend these things together and get the name with the hosting as one package. Um, websites are really cheap these days. Um, by cheap, I mean you can expect to pay for really good service with lots of different technical capabilities, maybe about $10 a month. So everybody can afford to have their own you know, sophisticated website. Now, that doesn't, that's not the cost of building the website, but that's the cost of hosting the website. And um, there's no reason uh, these days to go through a um, relatively uh, uh, you know, highly consumerized uh, uh, outfit that will host pages for you. You, know, you can really do this on your own with your own URL, have your own pages, uh, and it's not very expensive to do that. And there's a lot of probably your friends over in engineering who will help you develop a web page. It's, it's just so uh, pervasive these days. So there's not much of a reason to rely on a company to kind of put up your web page for you. You can do it yourself. OK. Um, so you've got your uh, URL. I would actually suggest you get your URL before you check, or, or maybe it could be the same day. But the getting reserving the URL is actually more important than looking at the patent trademark and other legal aspects, because it's pretty easy to uh, have a legal name with a, with a few twists to get by some of the legal problems you might have. But once that URL is gone, it's gone. Once somebody gets abc.com, there's nobody else that's going to get that. OK, so how do you check whether you're going to have some problems with the name from a legal point of view? The first thing you want to do is go to TESS, T-E-S-S, which is the uh, website that handles trademarks uh, in this kind of big you know, a unified uh, area. It's, it's run by the, uh, the federal government. Uh, by, by the way, this is the US. If you're doing international, uh, that's a whole different hunt. It's complicated, and uh, trademark laws are uh, uh, not the same around the world. And if you're in China or places like that, it's even more problematical, and that's a different conversation. But for most of you, what you're really going to want to care about is US trademark problems. And so you go to TESS, which is right here, and you, you log in there, and you start searching. You put in your name and uh, see what kind of conflicts there are. Now, just because a name that's identical or virtually the same is there does not mean that it's a problem from a trademark point of view. Because trademarks are relatively narrow, 
in that they pertain to a certain kind of activity. So you can have delta airlines, and you can have delta faucets, and that's okay. Because they're in this narrow domain. Anybody who's buying a faucet is not going to be confused that they thought they were getting on an airline. And what the trademark office says is, if there's no reasonable expectation of confusion, 